uno. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone. We are uh, week 12. Uh, this week is dedicated to designing and empowering for inclusivity. And um, before starting, I would like to remind that uh, uh, we have uh, a code of conduct and community participation guidelines. Uh, briefly, be nice and um, stay open and present and listen. And if you experience uh, some unacceptable behavior or any concerns, please, uh, you can report it to the organizers, Yo, Malika, Emmy, and Berenice. We, we are at the um, lines of 62. These welcoming notes are there. And uh, without uh, waiting too much, I would um, go straightly to the uh, introducing the topic. And we often uh, repeat this phrase and like the motto that open leaders, they design and build projects that empower others to collaborate within inclusive communities. So uh, there is some sense of ecosystem there and uh, therefore the topic of designing for inclusion. And I'm super um, ready to invite you to do silent note taking uh, at the line 17 in the etherpad. Um, I'll just put again the link in the chat for those who are just joining. We're line uh, 72 and we are answering the question, what's the place that made you feel included the first time you visited it? It could be online or in person place. And just uh, take a couple of seconds to to remember that place, maybe you can imagine it um, as well as uh, what it would be if it was a landscape or a picture. Um, think what made that place so inclusive. And with this, I will myself type the answer. If the etherpad gets angry, refresh it and type type your notes in a different, um, like, you know, on a notepad or something, and then just paste them in. Sometimes lots of people typing at once, it gets a bit. Oh, that's uh, many really nice places. I uh, just can read out loud some answers. Uh, Alessandra says, the library of my hometown, nobody cared who you are, how you look like. Jyoti writes, my primary school. Jyoti, would you like to, to add a couple of notes or on what made that place so inclusive if you can get to this? Um, Yor says she has been attending a workshop on how to raise money for not profits. We all share, share. We all share shared goals. Love it. Goals of making a world a better place, and we have shared expectations not to own too much of the space left by one another. That's very powerful. 
but also as a Turing way book dash, it was very welcoming. Despite the first time I joined Evelyn when I started university, there are so many great um, places mentioned. Roland mentions his first talk around diversity and inclusion at the conference. Great, there are so many. Uh, just, yeah, I would invite you to, to continue uh, adding and reading uh, these, these comments. And I would move to, to introducing Roland, inviting him for the, um, for the talk on unconscious bias, does it matter? If it's fine, if, if if anyone is fine with it or anyone wants to unmute and maybe say something about this inclusive place. Looks like... I, mean, I was going to say, yeah, coming back, uh, it, uh, it feels like just catching up with very old friends. And, you know, I think I was a bit anxious leading up to that. And as soon as I jumped on, I was like, oh, Catching up with friends. Okay, cool. This took took the anxiety completely out. Thanks, Roland. And would you like to? Uh, I would give you the the microphone and invite you to then share with us. Welcome back. Did you want me to start? Okay. Could I share my screen? Uh, I don't think. Should be okay. open now. Can you see that? Okay now. Do you think it mattered to Ruby? Uh, sorry, I was. Jumping too far ahead. So thanks. Um, so quick introduction. My name is Roland. I started writing up about diversity inclusion maybe about three years ago, maybe four years ago, actually. And it was basically because I saw a gap between what people were thinking, uh, what was needed, which was more sort of corporate driven and what I was hearing from the grassroots advocates and uh, the uh, people from marginalized groups. And uh, uh, Yo asked me to, to do this last year. And this is pretty much exactly the same talk with some uh, websites that have slightly changed. Um, so there shouldn't be any surprises. Um, and for me, unconscious bias is a very touchy subject. And so one of the things that I wanted to talk about this is to look at it from a different point of view and ask, does it really matter? Um, and the thing that I always highlight in my slides early on is that uh, this can challenge you. This may challenge you. And being uncomfortable is actually part of change. And you know, this is an opportunity for me to share what I think is needed to bring to the conversation. And it doesn't shy away from uncomfortable truths. One of the things I thought about recently is like there's sort of two ways of working in sort of this this space you can either pretend that superman is real or you can have a conversation and says that superman isn't real and when you when you're in this conversation where superman is real sometimes people don't like to challenge to highlight to, to people who think that superman is real that hey actually this person doesn't exist and uh, that's part of these uncomfortable truths that some people have to be able to move through to, uh, to, to actually say, well, what can we actually do? What can we do ourselves? And with the, the story I talk about in particular is this idea of Ruby Bridges, who was, nine, who was six in 1960. We, and she went to a previously white school. And you can see on the, the link here is that uh, um, she had to walk through uh, groups of women who are holding up um, the equivalent of death threats to her. Um, 
I have a seven-year-old, I have a three-year-old, and I can't really imagine if I how I would feel if that had happened to my to my kids. And the entire the entire year, uh, Ruby wasn't allowed to eat food just for her safety. And how does that tie back in with unconscious bias? The question there I want to sort of get people to ask is, do they think that the people who are outside the school protesting, do you think that was conscious or unconscious bias? And I don't necessarily, I just want people to think about that themselves and, and reflect um, because I've got my sort of idea, but I just wanted people to think about, you know, these people, they went and purchased a coffin, they went and purchased a black baby doll. You know, was this conscious or unconscious bias? So regardless of what you thought, this is my thoughts on it was, do you think it mattered to Ruby? Do you think a six-year-old would be worried about whether it was conscious or unconscious? deliberate or accidental. I think this is really the key about what I concern myself with, um, with unconscious bias. The, the, the training around unconscious bias is a little bit of a sensitive topic, I think, for me. Another question then becomes, do you think it mattered to Tamir Rice? So Tamir Rice was 12 years old when he was killed by a policeman while holding a replica gun. He didn't make any verbal threats and he didn't point the gun towards the officers. And from the uh, video recordings, it was about maybe a minute between the police car pulling up and the time he got shot. And so again, the question is with his family, with Tamiya, would they care if it's conscious or unconscious bias? And you start to see these patterns emerging when you, when you look at that and you start to say, well, did it really matter to to the, to the person who suffered the consequences of this. And uh, in January 2015, um, we're talking about uh, Abdelmain Benchik, um, someone who come from a Moroccan heritage in Belgium. Uh, he had his left leg amputated after a police car hit him. So, you know, and the, there was a Facebook statement saying, what is he complaining about in his country that would have cut off his hands? And he'll run slower next time. And that's just one story. But do you think that whether it's unconscious or conscious or unconscious would it really make a difference to them? And uh, I think that's one of the key things I'd want us to think about as we go through this, our presentation. And it's not, those are very, very obvious things, but they're more subtle uh, signs. So this is um, Vanessa Nakate who I follow now on Twitter, and she was just cropped out, uh, just removed completely. And you think, well, you know, maybe it was conscious, maybe it was unconscious, maybe it was something else, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think it was just at Davos, but it happened to her again. Uh, these slides are old. It actually happened to her again, uh, I think last year, early last year, late last year, early this year, um, at another conference where she was actually just cropped out of the picture. And so that subtlety means that people miss out on opportunities. And the bias actually includes who gets forgiven and who gets punished. So a really ex great example here is Brock Turner, who was a um, uh, convicted of sexual assault only getting three months. Uh, and this Georgia team getting five years for, um, for a shoe robbery and going to prison. Uh, the reason why Brock Turner was um, his, uh, his uh, conviction was reduced was because he was part of the Olympic swimming team, or he had the potential to be part of the Olympic swimming team. So when you're starting to look at these things, when people do the same thing and you get, a, uh, you can start to see uh, when you follow these stories, who gets forgiven and who gets punished. Um, and here's another example, uh, just recently in Australia around COVID, where uh, people in um, uh, the nice parts of Victoria, uh, people weren't wearing a mask and they were not having a problem. But on the other side, uh, there were nine uh, public housing towers that were surrounded by police. 
um, and they were locked down because they were worried that they would um, go spread things. And you can see the difference in the way that uh, the way that people were treated, just between just based on their location and where they came from. And again, it's who's forgiven and who gets punished. Uh, later on, the New South Wales uh, State Health Minister, uh, um, there were some things where they actually talked about doing exactly exactly this at a statewide level uh, in New South Wales, which is a state of uh, Australia. So both of these happened in Australia. And these biases uh, are obstacles for people from marginalised groups. And, and in this example here, uh, you're seeing someone, they're running the same race, but actually there's a different degree of difficulty in that same race. It's the same distance, but uh, there's a different degree of difficulty. Uh, and so when I talk about intersectionality, um, I talk about uh, being belonging to more than one marginalised group. And the more marginalised groups you belong to, the more difficult, the higher your degree of difficulty is. Uh, I, re I really like this. Um, this image where, you know, what's the matter? It's the same distance, um, but actually it's not the same degree of difficulty. And when I take all of that into account, I start to think about, you know, this is why we should centre uh, the victim, not the perpetrator, when we're looking around this. And so one of my criticisms of unconscious bias is that it centres the perpetrator and not the, I, don't, I shouldn't call it victim, actually, I should change these slides, but the person who's being marginalised. And this is from a, an article, but if the outcome is the same, is calling it unconscious simply an easy get out clause for racist behavior? Is the concept of unconscious bias just a convenient way for people to avoid acknowledging racism or taking any responsibility for their actions? That's the, that's the tricky part around this unconscious bias training. So the things that I always say is that listen to the people who are the most marginalized in your society because they're the canaries in the coal mine. Um, and how comfortable they are. This is Iad, who I, I follow a lot on Twitter. You know, they're, they're a barometer. And you can actually see that in America, in Australia, uh, especially, and a little bit in the UK, where the people who are the most marginalised were treated badly, and the way that they were treated badly has now seeped into other uh, parts of the community as well. So the way I talk about it is we should like in a hospital's emergency department, we should look after the people who are the most marginalised first. The greater the need, the earlier they're seen. And uh, that's a lot of text. I should get rid of this slide. <laughs> uh, to give you an idea of what I really mean is that you've got this idea of an intersectionality spectrum where what I'm trying to say here is that the more marginalised groups you belong to, so for example, Indigenous female, the higher your degree of difficulty is. And at the moment in Australia, uh, we look after people more on this side of the spectrum than on this side. But if we're acting like a hospital and we're triaging properly, ooh, we should be looking, we should be supporting people more here. It's not that we don't support people here, it's just that we'd be putting more of our effort into here and, and working the way. And we're actually doing it the opposite way in most, in most areas. And that's why I think understanding intersectionality and treating it as belonging to one or more marginalised groups uh, allows you to start to think about, right, who do I, who do I look after to the right of me? So I, I sit around here, so I'm actually quite highly privileged. And my question is, every time, you know, how do I look after people who are to the right of me? How do I amplify their, their, their discourse? What are they really asking for? But we can't just listen, we have to show courage and act. And a really great, again, this Ruby uh, example, um, there's only one teacher who was willing to uh, teach Ruby, and it was the first white student who broke the boycott and into the school. And, you know, that would have taken a lot of coverage from their point of view, because they'd be basically alienating themselves from, from civil society. And this is this idea, if you're neutral, you're, on, you're going to be on the side of the oppressor. And it takes courage to be able to say, well, no, I need to be, uh, in some cases, anti-racist or uh, anti-ageist or anti-ableist. And that's actually really not easy. That's not easy. So this is what I 
sort of tying back into the idea of being inclusive, you know, my, my personal point, when I know that I'm supported and people understand why I'm sensitive, I feel safe. And when I'm still safe, I can be myself and be able to share where something's wrong without being worried about losing my job, losing friends or damaging my career. And, and for me, that's inclusion. If I can do that, then I know that I'm feeling safe. Um, and it's sort of interesting that even when people say they want to have uh, inclusive spaces, um, there's this sort of gap. And I just realised it recently where a lot of people who have been marginalised have anger that they need to express as well. And actually, if they can't express that kind of anger uh, in, a, in a healthy way, the safe probably the, the space probably isn't that safe to them. And I just found that out just recently where I realised I was holding back from a place that was supposed to be inclusive and I had to go and debrief with other people where I could vent, I could let my anger out. Um, and that was sort of like an eye-opener for me. And so it's not just about everyone being calm and respecting other people. There's also times where the the needs to the the authentic emotions need to be shared there as well. How that's done in practice, uh, I think it depends on the situation. So here's some things that you can do. You can change your social media to centre in sexually marginalised people. Um, you can go out of your way to encourage people from marginalised groups. Uh, you can go out of your way to identify talented people from marginalised groups. Uh, you can look at ways that you can use your privilege to step aside so that it gives more opportunity for people from marginalised groups. And uh, when it's when you feel that you've got you know some of this nuanced understanding, look at ways you can change the systems in your organisation. And here's an example of um, uh, Ella Fitzgerald talking about Marilyn Monroe on the right here, saying that she didn't need to learn more skills. She didn't need to do anything. She needed the opportunity to be able to demonstrate her, her skill set. And once she got that opportunity, she never had to play small jazz club again. So to be an ally to people in one or more marginalized groups by listening and supporting them to your right in that intersectionality spectrum. And there's a few sort of links there if you wanted to know more. Thanks. Yes, that is the end of the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Roland. It was uh, so powerful and just... Uh, I, I forgot one thing. I forgot one thing. Um, I was jokingly saying this to someone, but actually it's true. I know this might be quite might have been a little bit confronting and maybe it brought people to a level of discomfort, but actually I realized that this is the gentlest level that I can present at and still stay authentic, if I could say. So there's actually two levels higher of um non-gentleness <laughs> and I just wanted to just sort of I didn't realize this until last week or I realized you know what I, I I pitch it at this sort of level where it might be higher than what other people pitch but still isn't it's not appropriate to go into that second or third level straight away because I just don't know where everyone's come from I don't know where people have been I don't know if it's going to be triggering and a lot of these things might be triggering as well which I apologize if it is. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that too. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm open to any questions. Um, Thanks, Roland. Mm -hmm. um, I will just, you know, I mean, we definitely need to add some of things you can do, slide like, uh, and share within the community so everyone can start actually putting it in practice. I was wondering if you know examples of safe spaces that allow communication on these topics. Yeah, in a way that is both gentle and authentic. It, it's tricky. Like it's really tricky because it was, it was made very, very clear to me in one of my recent sort of forays into this 
that people are just different levels of maturity in the process. And actually, you sort of need to step through the gears, so to speak. And uh, I remember being in one part where I had to be very, it was a, an immature sort of conversation. And I stepped back and I was talking to a friend of mine. And, you know, I could just say, I could just sort of like, hey, this is where they're at and this is what I'm doing and it's just really frustrating or whatever it was. And she goes, yeah, like, I get that. Like, they just get it. And I remember introducing someone else. Uh, I talked with this other person and I introduced someone else. And immediately because of the shared experiences, it was very easy to connect because the level of maturity around these conversations, we didn't have to go through the up through the gears. So it really has to be specific. And I think one of the, the challenges that people face is that when they start coming into this idea and say, how can be an ally? They might be 30 or 40 years late to the party. You know, and uh, as I've gone through this process, I realize I'm always late to the party. I'm always picking up things. I'm always picking up things. And I'm always going to be late to the party. It's just, it's just the way it is. And so it's not on anyone's thing. But when people in privilege realize that they want to be allies, but they center themselves, you don't get much, you don't get much headway. But if you have people with privilege who actually center people who are highly marginalized or intersectionally marginalized, uh, things can change quite dramatically and quite smoothly. But there's a, there's a power dynamic to that as well. So, you know, the people who are competitive, who want to uh, hold power, are not the people who are going to share power. And so if you look at a very hierarchical institution like a, like a university, you know, those steps up there are usually around people who are trying to gain power as opposed to share power. And I think that's a, a dynamic to, to, to recognise as well. That's why change is so difficult. And, and at its heart, diversity and inclusion is a change management process. It's just a change management process in a specific kind of socio-political, socio-technical way. Right, that's... Uh... It's like answering many, many things in a way. Um, we have uh, two questions um, in the effort part at line 101. Like one, what are the ways to get past and get through the workspaces that support member only mindset? Um, another one is... Question? Uh, say it again, please. Could I just get a clarification on that question? Member only yeah. mindset. Yeah, if the person who wrote it can uh, maybe yes. unmute and explain. Uh, yes, Raul. And so um, there are uh, certain spaces where uh, uh, people only with uh, say certain uh, background experiences or uh, from certain um, uh, ethnic groups are more welcome, mostly. Um, more to uh, how to get through those spaces. Did you mean how to diversify the people who are discussing those those spaces? Is have I have I understood that correctly? Uh, 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 how, if I, if I want to be a part of such a place, how do I? Um, um, uh, you know, enter a, such a workplace and um, have a supportive environment there. Yeah, I think the more I think about this, the more my answer kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know when you when you uh, think you know something and you go, oh, "Look, there's an easy answer for that," and then you learn more about it and you realize there's not. It's it's like that. Um, I think it's really contextual, and I think it is almost like oh, this is going to sound awful. I, I haven't really. I've got this idea around how I say this, but it's going to sound awful. It's like you take an individual who's coming into that space 
and you say, right, okay, you probably don't, you're probably a quite a diverse person according to the space. Um, you're probably the most, uh, you know, you might be the most marginalized person that we need to make sure that we, we look after. Can you please tell us what you need to, to thrive in our space? And, and whatever you're willing to share with us right now, you might not want to share everything, but whatever you can share with us right now, because I think there's a level of trust that you might have to let us know something, we will try to accommodate that. And then that person, if they feel comfortable, they might share with you what, what they need to get something sorted. That might be accessibility if they have a disability. It might be because they have, they, they have caring responsibilities, so they need more flexibility. Now, how you react to that, if you react in a positive way, if you act in, uh, in, a, in a way that's like uh, shows them that you value them, that you're listening to them and that you're willing to act on it, they will feel like they're valued. And that might increase their trust so that next time you ask that question, because you will, might have to ask it more than once, they might actually share with you a little bit more. And so there can be an incremental level of trust that's built. Also, you can, you can uh, demonstrate that you won't tolerate certain behaviours as well, which also uh, shows them that you have a, an understanding of some of the nuances that are involved with intersectionality. Um, and so providing, being a role model and modeling good behavior is important if you're one of the uh, leaders in the community as well. And <laughs> I, I just had uh, a microaggression happened today, like right, right before this meeting. And it was like, you know, these microaggressions, a microaggression to me is something that demonstrates to someone who's a, from a marginalized group that they don't belong. So they can be welcomed into an institution or a, or a place or a space, but they can still have a microaggression that shows that they don't belong. Right. And uh, that, that happened sort of just recently and I just, you know, it catches you off guard sometimes and after a while the, the, the moment's gone. But if you're going to show leadership, you would jump on that and demonstrate that, hey, we, we don't want to, um, to do that. That will build trust in everyone else. So it's actually holding people accountable. Uh, uh, I think uh, one of my dear friends, talks about code of conducts and saying they're nice, but they have to be held accountable to be able to make sure that's that. So it's all these little small things. It's not just one thing, but if I could say lots of small things and the trust will build and people will feel more safe. And that happens over time, but it only takes one situation to lose that. And then you're starting again. It's snakes and ladders. Right, you can easily go up and you just hit one snake and you just go all the way down. And it's just amazing when you're looking at governments and on the one hand, they're saying, hey, we really wanna help this, uh, these marginalized people. And then on the other hand, they're doing something terrible to them at the same time. It's like they don't talk to each other. And, uh, you know, having that kind of uh, nuance about, right, what, what do people feel unsafe with? Why do they feel unsafe? When you're centering those perspectives, marginalized perspectives, after a while, it becomes second nature because you're listening to people who are, um, who are uh, intersectionally marginalized because they're getting racist comments and they're getting ableist comments. And right, it just becomes, you, you're, you're seeing it in your, in your Twitter feed or your Instagram feed, you're seeing it uh, all the time. And so all of a sudden you're, you're sort of, uh, you know, what's that word when you're doing ethnography, where you just sort of like you're embedding yourself into the, um, into the society and you're sort of just like uh, learning on the supply. It's that kind of embedded mindset so that you're, you're understanding that, that community. 
And uh, the problem is that people who are the most marginalized in our communities, they're pushed to the margins. So you don't you don't hear from them in 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 the mainstream media. You don't see them in your normal groups because they haven't even gotten to that point where they can be a part of the social groups that we have. I have rambled on. I will stop now. Do we, Wesley, do we have time for another question or? Um, I I would say we will use uh, the momentum and with the, the fact that you already warmed up us to move to Ali skills training part. And um, I would like to thank you. Uh, let's <laughs> send applauses to Roland for doing this talk and discussion. And I would, yeah, I would leave maybe to question and answers. There is a, le uh, a great question on how do you decide which level to use in your presentations, which we can continue. Well, thank you. And I give microphone to you, Malvika and Amy. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, uh, Roland, for a, a vulnerable and difficult talk. Uh, we, we, we value that you come uh, and, and give this, the, you know, you, you're revealing parts for yourself in a way that's really, really difficult um, and is important to us. Thank you, Maya, for hosting challenging topics. And also, thank you, everyone who's here. And I realize we didn't do any content warning beforehand, and we just launched straight to, hey, this is kind of tough stuff. And I know most of the time OLS, we are cheery and we are happy. Um, and you may have been like, whoa, <laughs> what's happened here? Um, but unfortunately, these are things that if you talk about it in a cheery way, it probably doesn't hit the way it's going to need to, to actually be serious about it. Um, but here's the nice positive bit. Um, we're doing a cut down section of our ally skills workshop where we talk about things that you can actions that you can take much like Roland said it's not just a label you can wear but actions that you can take to try and do better um emmy i think last time we ran this you did the first intro bit but i know that you arrived late to the call do you feel um comfortable launching into the slides and kicking off or would you rather um if one of if Malvika or i took it uh, I can do it. I have the slides open. <laughs> Amazing. Then I will pass the baton to you. We don't have a bunch of time, so super All right. speedy is good. We'll do the super speedy version and try and leave more time for your discussions and, and scenarios. Um, so, uh, yeah, welcome to this Ally Skills Workshop, uh, speedy and truncated. <laughs> Um, so this is really focused on the aim here is again, as Joe said, to you know make make this a bit more tangible. It could feel quite overwhelming and uh, powerless to do something sometimes. But this is really uh, taking another perspective and to try and see what you can do in your personal capacities where you feel comfortable and safe to action and be an ally to those marginalized and underrepresented groups in and people in your communities and groups. So um, it's gonna, if the slides would move, okay. Uh, I think we're gonna try and speed through the discussion, uh, the introduction and leave you more time for discussions. Um, so if you, I think we can share, there's a link to these slides probably in the notes. If not, we can put it in the chat. Um, but so in case I'm speaking too fast and you would like more time to digest, um, you can also refer to the slides as well. So um, let's talk about technical privilege. I mean, we, I, I feel like I, um, I have a, I have a, a PhD uh, in neuroscience and then have been through, you know, have had experience in, uh, doing roles in community management and in, in open science. And um, that's sort of my own technical privilege, right? Um, that I have had that education and have afforded these experiences. Um, and we all tend to listen to people who are more technical um, in, in our fields. But, and I just want to acknowledge that the reason we OLS, uh, our organizers keep doing these type of workshops and think that is really important is that we're trying to use our own privileges to try and move the needle and try and use this privilege to end this technical privilege. We shouldn't be 
listening to people just because they're more technical or or more um, educated. You know, all of our knowledge and experiences are valid and we should really acknowledge that and elevate those experiences. So um, it's always good to start with some terminology so we could familiarize ourselves with the discussions moving forward. Um, a, when we talk about privilege, which I already did a lot, we're talking about an unearned advantage given by society to some people, but not all. Um, when we say oppression, we're talking about systemic pervasive inequality that is present throughout society and that benefits people with more privilege and harms those with fewer privileges. So privilege, oppression. Then marginalized people, a member of a group that is the uh, primary target of a system of oppression. And then an ally, which we're trying to be, um, are members of a social group that enjoys some privilege, but is actively working to end the oppression and understand their own privilege. Um, ally is the verb, not an identity. What does that mean? Um, we, whether or not you are an ally um, depends on your action, right? So you, if you are, let's say you're a marginalized person, that's, that's an identity. That's, that's not really, it doesn't depend on what you do. It's, it's part of your identity in a way. But being an ally is about what you do um, it's about practicing those ally skills instead of, you know, you, you can't just take this course, take this workshop um, and call yourself a, an ally forever. As long if you don't use and practice the skills that you've earned or you've, you've gained in this workshop. Um, so depending on your situation, um, you, can, you, you can be a marginalized person or an ally, and you switch between um, those two, depending on you know who you're around and the situation. So just to give you an example, um, oh, I think I forgot to uh, refresh the slides here, but um, yeah, so a marginalized person, um, this is very much in the context of uh, the US and North America, I believe. A marginalized person is any black person who wants to enter a public shop. So um, yeah, a, a shop, a, a convenience shop, a convenience store or a supermarket um, in a white dominated country. And an ally could be, you know, a non-black person who donates to the legal system reform organizations, objects racist stories, call their uh, representatives or elected officials to support police reform and defunding and read news articles about their, own, uh, about their own privilege, right? So actions. A little bit more terminology. Um, power is the ability to control circumstances or access to resources and or privileges. And I think Roland talked a little bit about intersection, being intersectional and intersectionality. Um, this is the concept where people can be subject to multiple system of oppression that intersect um, and interact with each other. So you could be a person of color and um, uh, a short person, let's say. <laughs> it really depends on the situation, right? Um, but this term uh, is important to acknowledge that this has been coined by the legal scholar called Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, her picture is here on the, on the screen. So um, why are we focusing on ally skills and why are these important to learn? There was an experiment, a study where researchers found that when marginalized people work to increase diversity, actually they get worse performance evaluations from their supervisors. Um, so this is in the context of a working a team at work, for example. But when more privileged people work to increase that diversity, then supervisors give them better performance evaluations. So uh, it's not fair, but you know, that's why it's important that we don't focus, the, we don't leave the burden of change to those who are marginalized and instead use our privileges to stand up for those around us. Um, just a, an example that perhaps is not so uh, relevant, 
<laughs> so recent anymore, but still very relevant. Um, uh, the AI ethics and anti-bias advocate, Timnit Gebru, um, she joined uh, Google, um, and uh, but was then shortly after was fired. Um, and that's the reflective of the systemic oppression there is right within the organization and within the society is that there was this notion of hiring some, like a, a person of color or woman of color um, uh, where, you know, it's a tokenized hire, meaning this person is only recruited because the either the leadership wants the uh, organization or management to look more diverse. And then in reality, after sort of that honeymoon period of, of you know, trying to welcome them. The, the reality still remains that, you know, this person of woman of color sees the problem. She tries to point it out, but because there was no, you know, th there's no systemic change here. They, she repeatedly faces microaggression and, um, you know, just burn out, <laughs> right? Um, that that her, her requests or her opinion uh, input is, are repeatedly ignored. So um, this is why you know we work towards if there were people, perhaps more people around her who would stand up to the microaggression, stand up to you know say help her say no to the the um, the, opp the oppressive acts that are around, then things might be different. But again, this calls for you know that that mindset of like how this person is hired is. Uh, is a bit the is the is the issue here, right? Also, so we're gonna go into a little exercise. Um, as we mentioned, like an ally practices their ally skills just first by one of the ways to do that is by understanding their own privileges. So um, this exercise is voluntary; you don't have to do it. Um, but if you would, uh, I think there's a um, sheet in the slides. Uh, Yost pasted in the chat, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat now. Um, and we would like you to, sorry, it's one forward. We would like you to use this exercise to think a little bit about what privilege you have. Um, so if you can go to that link, we'll spend three, five minutes. Yeah, five minutes looking at the sheet and um, reflect and fill, fill it out yourself. I'll just add this is something for yourself, not something you have to hand in. So you can read through and think through it. You don't have to check it and share it. Okay, thanks for everyone who's taken a few minutes just to sort of uh, think through uh, the potential privilege and power that you may have and in other scenarios that you also may not have that so in one in one room that same privilege might actually not be a privilege in another room. Um, so I should just share my screen and very quickly i'm just going to ask if anyone has any thoughts that they would like to share. Um, or any surprises and you don't have to. Um, and in fact, maybe post them in chat if you don't want to share them um, or in the etherpad if you don't want to share them whilst we're recording as well. I also realized that my etherpad is possibly covered by my screen share. 
Wait, hold on. <laughs> Let me sort out my screens and make sure that I'm doing that right. Right, I think I fixed that anyway. Okay, um, I'm just gonna move on for the moment. Um, we can, these can be very personal reflections. So there's no requirement whatsoever to actually share these um, live. Um, but one thing that we do find is people say, wow, I, I didn't realize how many different types of privilege or power I did or didn't have. Um, that actually sitting and looking through a list can make you realize about scenarios where you, you didn't realize that maybe you were more privileged than other people or that you had um, you know, more ability to stand up. Um, right, so just to talk a bit about what the workshop is, um, we are not offering a get out of jail free card. Amy sort of talked about this a bit earlier. Um, this is not like, oh, I've done the workshop, so now I'm an ally. We are not giving legal advice, representing anyone's employers, um, and we're not going to discuss whether or not oppression exists or should be stopped. So we encourage you to challenge us to say, I don't agree with this particular thing, if it's um, a statement about being allies or pe scenarios people might experience. Uh, but we have to agree that we're all here because we, we care very much about people and about reducing oppression um, and about making sure that marginalized people become less marginalized. Um, sorry, I'm just getting distracted because um, uh, I, I know that the, we, we use the emojis to signal who goes next and I've only done like three slides. Malvika, do you want to take the next bit? We can go on, yeah. Okie dokie. Um, so as we've said before, you, um, you don't have to be here. You don't have to share anything that you don't want. We will never share breakouts or um, any questions and answers that, you, that we don't want to put anyone on the spot. Um, and this is voluntary. Another note, if you're sharing sensitive stories, uh, please anonymize them in the notes in the breakout rooms. Don't share things that you, you shouldn't be sharing. Um, and also similarly, when you're speaking to people, if they share things, remember that you, these shouldn't be necessarily shared onwards, except perhaps very anonymously in ways that can't reveal who's been spoken about. Um, so think about someone you've just met at a conference, you don't really know, that's a fair level of sharing, you know, so I spoke to my friend, not my great aunt is a racist. Um, <laughs> so Ally skills, we've talked a lot, a lot about them and the terminology that comes here. But the very basics is be short, be simple, be firm. Don't try to be funny. Um, so this isn't a place where, um, you know, make, making jokes necessarily is going to go well. And very often you may end up putting down other people as part of that. Um, do play for the audience. So think about who you're speaking to um, and make sure that it's at a level that's understood. This is something that I think Roland spoke about very clearly that, um, Sometimes there might be one thing that you want to say, but if it's not going to serve the purpose of actually being effective and useful, even if it's correct, um, it may not be the right place to say it and think about what level you can do that will be understood and that will be impactful. Um, practice simple responses. So as we all know, practice makes perfect. Um, and the more times that you think about specific scenarios that you might struggle with, the more times you think about how you might respond to it, the easier it comes when you actually get there and you have to do it maybe with little to no notice. Um, and pick your battles. We've talked about power, we've talked about privilege. If you don't have power um, and you're in a place where you're going to put yourself in danger of losing your job, because of that, or you're going to become that problem woman of color, maybe it's not the time for you to be doing this. Think about when you do have power and when you can stand up and make sure that you pick your battles based on what's sensible and what's safe. At no point are we saying that you should be a hero going down in flames. <laughs> um, don't put down other groups. Don't be sexist whilst you are supporting people of color. Don't be homophobic, transphobic, racist, ableist, classist, etc. This list will never be complete and it will never have everything. But the point is, be nice to people and don't put one group down whilst you're helping the others. Right, so everything we've been doing, it's awkward. You're like, oh, okay, this, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling good. I know that I need to do good stuff, but this is not easy. Here's a fox. Look at those ears, it's really furry. 
I mean, I just want to snuggle him. And she's having a gorgeous nap in the sun. Okay. 30 moment, 30 second timeline cleanse. Malvika, do you want to go through the next and then introduce the scenarios? Sure. Sorry, I, I, I totally threw that at you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, sure, no, I can take over. Please, please. Do you want to just tell me when to move slides or? Yeah, please go on. We're trying to make it very collaborative, folks. You can see how coordinated we are. Please, uh, so I think this is really important for us to mention that we all make mistakes. Um, I wouldn't say it for Roland, but of course, you know, I have made lots of mistakes. And even though I have lots of positive intention towards people, I also come with a lot of lived experience or biases that uh, may reveal sometimes in an unexpected way. And when that happens, the best way to move forward is to apologize, correct yourself and move on. Do not try to explain why you did what you did. Uh, the action hurt somebody, it's important to acknowledge that. The next slide, please. So one of my uh, mistakes was when one of my colleagues who was transitioning um, and they had already stated to everybody that they were using a pronoun she or they, but because of how I saw them, and how I my brain assumed what their gender might be, I mis misused the pronouns that I shouldn't have. And I immediately recognized that, I apologized for that. And uh, my friend was very kind to have moved past it immediately. But often that wouldn't happen. A lot of people when they're experiencing transition, for example, in this case, uh, they there is certain part of it that they are trying to get rid of. And by using wrong pronouns or misgendering them, we actually make it really difficult for them. So again, I'm not saying that this is, it is okay to make mistakes over and over, but this, this moment of acknowledgement and apology actually helps you get over it the next time. There are a lot of different kind of mistakes. It, this might be probably an exception um, and it, it is important for us to recognize it. So just repeating something what Amy was already saying that being an ally is all about action. It, it is uncomfortable to take some actions, uh, but as Roland was saying, we need to be courageous uh, and, and call out these difficult moments. Next slide, please. So now we want to actually prepare you to go to breakout rooms and talk to each other uh, based on uh, scenarios. So we will provide you a couple of scenarios, but before we do that, and because we are a very small room, um, I wonder if we could just take a few minutes to introduce yourself briefly, name, uh, gender pronoun, and position. Um, I. I'm gonna just ask you about it. Should we send them into breakout or should can we just do it here? I think it's a small enough group. Um, so let's just stop the recording. Uh, no more recording for the rest of this um, for the rest of this session, and then we can just discuss as a group. Um, yeah. But people who are core facilitators, like myself and Malvika and Emmy, we will we will step back. Um, and actually let other people do the discussion. So we will ask that y'all um, make the effort to, to step up and have these discussions as much as possible. Um, all right, let's stop the, stop the recording. I think in that case, you know, it actually makes sense to send them to breakout room because it might feel a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, like um, performing for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to just create a couple of rooms, um, have some people in there. Stopping now. 